Good afternoon. Welcome to iMerit's webinar on strategies for evaluating the quality of labeled data. We'll get started uh, in just a moment and give folks uh, a minute to join. Okay, let's begin. Um, so this webinar is entitled Ground Truth Grind, Strategies for Evaluating the Quality of Labeled Data. And um, I'll be your speaker today. My name is Teresa O'Neill and I'm a solutions architect at um, iMerit in uh, specializing in natural language services. I've been working with iMerit to develop natural language annotation solutions for a little over two years. Um, and I bring a research background and a teaching background in theoretical and applied linguistics. So in today's webinar, we're hoping that what you will take away from this is an approach to kind of questioning some assumptions you may have around the quality of labeled data and a notion of how to build trust in a labeled data set through three primary kind of cornerstones, transparency, processes, and measurements. We also invite you to check out our website for um, a white paper in Natural Language Processing uh, Annotation Services, entitled Not Lost in Translation. And you can find this on our website, imerit.net. Um, so a little background on who we are. Uh, we're a company that leverages human intelligence to label and enrich data. We enrich training data uh, accurately, securely, and with operational efficiency out of our nine centers, currently and able to work from home. Um, and our mission is to power algorithms and machine learning and computer vision, and also uh, primarily to affect positive social and economic change for a population, uh, a workforce that has been historically excluded from the digital environment. Our expertise is in computer vision, content and natural language services, and customer support. And today's webinar will focus on some of our learnings and best practices in the natural language services space. So first of all, um, a couple pointers on the importance of considering quality and quality evaluation when using labeled data for natural language processing, and machine learning use cases more broadly. So we, we're all familiar probably with the adage garbage in, garbage out, and even this sort of old but good little comic from um, XKCD from a few years back, uh, kind of poking fun at the black box nature of machine learning algorithms. So somebody says, you know, this is your system. Yep, you just pour the data into this big pile of algebra and then out the other side, you collect the answers. But if the answers are wrong, well, you just keep stirring until it looks right. This isn't a very satisfactory approach to improving models. So we would suggest, and so would many others, that another solution besides simply stirring the pot and retuning and reconfiguring and, um, uh, you know, fine tuning your models, you pour some better data in. And for supervised learning methods, this involves using improved, uh, higher quality training data. And for any modeling method, you'll also need evaluation and ground truth data sets. And although it is worth, it, it's a bit taxing um, to prepare a sound strategy for data quality, it's ultimately worthwhile. Some machine learning engineers may describe or potentially complain that they spend up to 80% of their time on data preparation and cleaning. And so by having a good strategy upfront to prepare high quality labels and develop that trust that the ongoing data pipeline is continuing to yield high quality data, you can save money, time, and also cognitive resources from your more valuable um, engineering teams who need to be focused on other things. The assurance of quality is not easy to guarantee, as we can see in this, this quote on the right-hand panel. Um, labeling projects involve multiple steps. They're very complex and they require some subjective decision making. So it's important to consider carefully your approach to uh, building trust in your, your labeled data set. Otherwise you'll be trapped in this sort of endless ground truth grind of manually reviewing things and, and iterating without a, a concrete uh, process in place. So how can you build that trust in the quality of your labeled data set? We suggest that there's three primary considerations. 
transparency, which really comes down to communication with your labeling partner, processes, which has more to do with planning the right kinds of workflows to build and then sustain and then improve quality, and also having a carefully considered approach to measuring quality so that you have that assurance in the long term that things are stable and also you can handle change appropriately. So the first of these cornerstones is transparency. And there are a few guiding questions here. First is what does high quality actually mean when it comes to this particular label data set? The second is what assumptions are we beginning with? And then what expectations do we have of our labeling partner and what expectations do they have of us? So you might be working on a natural language processing product um, or an NLP powered product of some sort. And it's important to think about the expectations that you bring to the table when working with a labeling partner and also what your labeling partner is expecting of you so that you can start out with a, a clear, transparent plan and on firm footing. So one um, you know, initial set of attributes you might think of when you think of high quality and labeled data, you might think of completeness, relevance, that the data be unbiased, that it be consistent, and that it be accurate. Certainly there are other attributes you might also throw around. However, these might not all be exactly the same weight and they might all be, not be equally applicable for every use case. So kind of what's good for the goose, maybe not, not good for the gander, depending on what you're trying to do with your data. Um, so for example, what's unbiased in one case, um, you know, may not really serve your purpose in another case because the biases may be informative or they may reflect real properties of the data that you need to be sensitive to. The completeness is really, really use case dependent. So what counts as appropriate kind of coverage of the domain or the expression space really varies depending on what you're trying to accomplish. We also generally bring to the table several assumptions regarding high quality data and what that quality really means. So we have to start questioning those assumptions. The first and maybe simplest of which is that quality is measurable and that ground truth actually exists. So there is a truth of the matter that we are trying to model and that truth is knowable. And then a little more subtle, we might also have the assumption that consistency among labels indicates accuracy or consistency sort of represents truth somehow. And further, that consistency is desirable. However, we really need to start getting really critical and thinking about whether these assumptions are valid and whether they do serve the use case that you have in mind. So for example, quality may be measurable for some data points, but not others. Others may just remain much too ambiguous or subjective or in fact they are so qualitative you want to allow them to vary freely. In some cases ground truth exists closely related to the above but if the task again is kind of unbounded or subjective there may not be an absolute truth of the matter and that's quite, a, quite all right. Um, ground truth may exist but may not be knowable so if you have a particular data point that is uh, unambiguous sorry is ambiguous and cannot be disambiguated by the labelers even if there was sort of an intentional truth of the matter maybe this is user data um, communicating some intent that to the original user was perfectly unambiguous, but we can't go back and interrogate that original user and find out what they intended. So the ground truth there in that case is not knowable. Further, consistency may indicate accuracy in some cases, but uh, not necessarily if it indicates bias. So sometimes you'll have consistent responses or labels which simply indicate a bias on the part of the data set or the users who are doing the labeling rather than actually accuracy or ground truth. And there are many anecdotes of these kinds of cases. And then finally, consistency may be desirable if there is sort of a knowable truth of the matter. However, it may not be desirable if it eliminates insights into uh, weaknesses in your labeling guidelines or potential areas of ambiguity that can be resolved. Sometimes you want that inconsistency to kind of shine a light on and triangulate what you're really trying to get at. So further, um, once we've questioned our initial assumptions, we wanna make sure that we share a set of expectations with our labeling partner. And this involves a mutual investment of time and effort and cognitive resources, especially at the beginning of an engagement in developing guidelines, um, which we discussed extensively in the, the previous webinar in the series, and in defining our quality parameters, developing metrics that are appropriate for that use case and that can measure those parameters, uh, developing a robust feedback cycle, with an ongoing conversation and having transparent reporting processes that allow us to track and act on insights. So that's our first cornerstone, transparency, involving a open lines of communication, careful questioning of assumptions, and setting shared expectations before beginning a project. The next cornerstone is, comes in processes, 
So some of you may recall, um, if, you were, if you joined us for the previous webinar, we discussed five steps in a pipeline for developing a successful annotation project. The latter two steps, feedback cycle and evaluation, are the processes that are most kind of intimately involved in developing a rigorous quality framework. So we're gonna focus on those in the next section of the talk. And what I wanna highlight here is kind of a conceptual distinction between quality control and quality assurance. Quality control is a process or a workflow designed to detect and then correct or remove defects, whereas quality assurance is a post hoc audit process designed to measure the quality of a data set. And ultimately, this is where your ongoing trust will come from. So a little schematic here to, to walk you through how we would conceptualize that process. We would begin with a set of guidelines or requirements come to via um, discussion between you and your labeling partner. And those guidelines would fuel, uh, of course, a training process which would lead to production. And then we would have a quality control process where uh, by some method or other, which we'll discuss some options shortly, defects in that set of labels are identified and removed, and any edge cases are escalated and resolved and go back to the guidelines for ongoing refinement and training. But after the defects are removed, we submit a final sort of version of the data set for an audit, where this is where quality assurance comes, where the labels will be evaluated against some rigorous metrics, ideally something quantitative. And then depending on the outcomes, we evaluate those metrics. Past data that is of sufficiently high quality goes on to become part of the training or evaluation data set, and failed data goes back to the production step for revisions. And this is where uh, we wanna consider how strategically we're investing our time and resources. So if we divide a project, a labeling project, into roughly four phases, during the initial calibration, ramp, and stabilization periods, there is a heavier investment of time and resources in that quality control feedback cycle than there is in the final and ideally longest stable phase of production, where that investment of resources, which you can see along the red curve here, is significantly lower. And this is more about sort of maintaining that quality being sensitive to any changes that come, and fine-tuning the metrics if required. So in developing a quality control process that works well for your, for your project, uh, it's crucial to align that process with the use case. So the optimal method for identifying and removing defects depends on what you're trying to do with your data and certain aspects of your data. So some factors to consider, I'll kind of skim the surface here, are the data type, so the modality of the data, uh, if it's uh, audio data, textual data, or image data, you might have a different approach to identifying and removing defects. The data complexity will also inform what kind of quality control method you use. If the subject matter requires uh, extensive expertise, then it may be um, a, a better bet to have an expert reviewer as a second step or second level sort of gatekeeper rather than relying on consensus methods. The labeling task of complexity will also inform the quality control method. So if there's a very large, very complex taxonomy of labels, if there's a lot of context dependency and very long document, if the labels themselves require a highly developed sense of metalinguistic awareness or advanced kind of linguistic training, um, or if there are a lot of steps, this will inform what kind of quality control method is best. So maybe if you have a very simple granular kind of atomic task, um, you can take a parallel approach to quality control and rely more heavily on consensus methods and an inter-annotator agreement. Whereas if you have a very complex task, it may make more sense to have a specially trained expert reviewer sampling and removing defects from tasks after they're completed. The ratio of, of kind of ambiguous to unambiguous content will also inform the kind of quality control method that suits your data as will the level of subjectivity in the output. So for example, in a text creation project, for instance, generating question-answer pairs that are relevant to a particular corpus, uh, it may not be relevant to have a simple sort of pass-fail strategy. You may want to have different kinds of options for quality control, since the data output itself is totally subjective and is expected to vary widely. So just a couple of examples here, we have a simple entity identification and labeling process. This is a, the kind of task that really is quite objective um, and where you could have subsampling and a pass-fail strategy. For a more complex dialogue labeling type task, we would likely want to have experts 
uh, reviewing the data, and we would have to divide up this task into more atomic subtasks if we were to use an inter-annotator agreement type approach. We also want to think about efficient allocation of precious resources when designing quality control methods. So we want to be judicious about when to use manual methods like expert review or arbitration of disagreements and inter-annotator um, agreement comparisons versus automatic methods which can detect outliers, anomalous annotations, and also check the data against certain hard-coded rules of business logic or guidelines logic. Now, designing an optimal process, um, there are a few things to consider in addition to the above. We also want to consider just sort of the nuts and bolts of the process itself. For instance, how many judgments do you want per task? And the number of judgments that are um, useful, worthwhile, really varies with the kind of task you're trying to perform and the subjectivity of the task. Do you want to have a blind or an open design for review? So should that expert reviewer be able to see who did what? And should they have access to the first pass of data? Or do we want to use a blind method to potentially identify uh, and eliminate uh, biases that will really throw a wrench in your data set? And then who do you want to serve as the final authority for resolving disagreements or um, giving kind of the seal of approval to a data point before it goes off to metrics? Um, so this table kind of maps out what those options might look like. So you might have a parallel process with multiple annotation that is open and relies on a consensus method. And this I would recommend uh, during the training process. So for example, um, a complex labeling case where you're categorizing entities against a really deep taxonomy, it's useful during the training period to have multiple people annotating, have them communicating with each other openly, and trying to come to a consensus to master the taxonomy and identify ambiguities so that you can improve your guidelines. You might want to move that to a blind process, however, if you have very high subjectivity or high bias risk kinds of data. So if you're doing search relevance, for example, or open sort of taxonomy um, generation or intent categorization, there's a lot of risk there um, that you end up with unwarranted consensus where you have you know, the, the strong person in the jury room forcing everyone to a particular conclusion when actually your data set would benefit from a little more variation. Sequential processes are useful when you have high expertise required or a very long tail of edge cases where you need to have an arbitrator resolving disagreements which are the, in the output of sort of a double blind parallel process or you want to have a judge um, or an expert correcting the defects in a data set where there's simply a lot of complexity and a high probability that annotators are making errors in the early stages of a project. Ultimately, for very stable, high volume projects, it's useful to have a mixed method. And the method might change throughout the lifespan of a project as the labelers develop expertise, as that long tail gets kind of chipped away, and as the guidelines become more robust for ambiguous cases. Another important thing to consider in developing your quality control method is that the re results be interpretable and actionable. So we want the results of the quality control process and the defect removal process to inform constant improvement. We want them to generate insights into patterns of error, exceptions to the guidelines or anomalies in the guidelines or anomalies in the training. We want them to inform improvement to those guidelines, but also to individual mastery and proficiency, um, ongoing assessment, um, potentially improvements to the workflow if there is something about the layout um, and the structure of the task that's leading to issues. And then finally, you want them to fuel kind of an iteration and targeted rework and testing where you can evaluate the impact of those improvements against your metrics. So now we come to the metrics and the quality assurance process. Developing a quality assurance process, the owner um, can be kind of, uh, it can be a shared responsibility between the client or your internal team and your labeling team or domain experts. And as I pointed out in the curve of the project milestone structure earlier, there's typically a higher cost burden on your team during the initial stage, and then that burden will shift to your labeling partner as a project stabilizes and matures. And generally, we would rely on um, quantitative metrics run against either sort of an inter-annotator agreement structure or a benchmarking where you have kind of holdouts tasks that you know are gold tasks, so you can run comparison with them, um, or sometimes sort of a benchmarking by proxy, so you create a similar 
kind of task that mimics the structure but maybe has certain known quantities where maybe the, the uh, ratio of ambiguous tasks is lower or you're targeting particular known problematic categories and then you evaluate the output against um, those benchmarks. So how do you conduct that evaluation? Well, you need measurement. And when it comes down to developing metrics for a label data set, sometimes we're dealing with more of an art than a science. It's kind of a fusion. So here the considerations are whether you're measuring for consistency or accuracy, how you align these metrics with your priorities, and then uh, how you get back to the initial point about transparency by building reports that are actionable and that are shared openly to enable that ongoing improvement. So whether you use consistency or accuracy as your focus in designing metrics depends on what you're trying to do. If you're conducting a, um, a task that is measured along kind of a scalar var variable and that expects some informative disagreements or variation between users like sentiment analysis or search relevance, then it's useful to measure consistency. If you're getting wildly inconsistent results, then something is probably wrong with the way your labelers are understanding the data. Or there are some really unexpected areas of variation and ambiguity that you might want to control for by expanding your taxonomy or rethinking exactly how you're going about your project. When it comes to labeling entities, relations among entities, and to some extent intents, you want to consider your, your accuracy measures, or sorry, your quality measures more in terms of accuracy than consistency. Because in the case of entities and relations, typically there is a gold, um, a ground truth, sort of a knowable ground truth of the matter. For intents, it depends on the domain, whether you have a knowable ground truth or a little bit of variation. But in general, with dialogue labeling, such as what you see here, which is a uh, kind of a constructed example from a food service, uh, customer service exchange dialogue labeling use case, accuracy is a more powerful quality metric than consistency. Because in most of, most of these labels, there is a knowable ground truth of the matter. So in designing these measurements, uh, measurement strategies and metrics, we wanna make sure that the metrics are priority aligned. So that means you have to consider, for example, whether you want a kind of a holistic picture at the macro level of how many of your labels are correct versus incorrect, or per perhaps by label type across your whole data set, the ratio of correct to incorrect, or whether you want to look at this on a document by document level. Um, and this is a, an important question to kind of resolve on early in the game so that you know whether you're looking across the whole corpus or within each document and then kind of averaging across documents. Those will give you a different picture of accuracy and it depends a lot on the distribution, uh, the sort of expected distribution of categories within documents. You also want to consider whether the, the same metrics that are appropriate for objective categories in your data set are also appropriate for subjective categories. So if you have a lot of objective entity labels, but a lot of very subjective intent labels, it's possible that what works for one might not work so well for the other. It's also very useful to categorize relevant errors by label type to enable improvement um, and iteration for your labeling team, and also to understand um, holistically how your labelers are faring and develop that trust in your data set it's useful to code major versus minor error categories separately to some extent. Then we also have an additional challenge of considering how to tabulate um, correct and incorrect labels for primary versus dependent categories. And I'll walk you through what I mean by primary versus dependent labels. Imagine we have an entity labeling use case where we're labeling certain types of noun phrases, pronouns, and categorizing them. Let's say we're, we're mentioning ODSE, the upcoming now remote conference taking place formerly in Boston, but now online next week. Um, if we say we attended ODSE, the correct label for this entity is conference. But let's say some of our labelers um, erroneously labeled it as company, and let's say some other labelers uh, failed to label it all together. Well, in the miniature corpus <clears throat> with three different um, approaches to labeling, we can see that Four of the labels were perfect matches to ground truth. One was a total miss, that's the one in red, and the other was sort of a pure label error. They captured the, um, the entity, the span is correct, and it was labeled, but it was labeled with the wrong category. Now, what about dependent attributes? Let's say we are also trying to track co-reference and we use referential indices 
in our schema to represent um, these co-reference relationships. So each of our entity labels now has a little subscript that tracks its referent. Well, what if your referential tracking is correct, but your primary label is wrong? It becomes a little more cumbersome to design the metrics and the tools to deliver these metrics to tabulate those. So there's an important consideration whether to sort of exempt um, mismatched dependent labels if the primary label uh, is, is wrong, so that your trust in your data set is not artificially um, kind of uh, deflated by the fact that the primary label was incorrect. So if you want to know how is my labeling team doing understanding and correctly implementing referential index labels, you'd want to count independently of the question of how they're counting the entity taxonomy labels. So for example, here, where ODSE is incorrectly labeled as a company, it is correctly labeled with subscript J, indicating its co-reference with the pronoun it. So we might say, look, our dependent labels are all correct, but we still have some work to do mastering the entity taxonomy. So with a metric strategy uh, incorporating those elements, we want to put that together into a report that is transparent, that can be shared between the labeling team and your project and product owners, um, which delivers quantitative insights that are uh, actionable. So we can say, all right, we've got 90% perfect matches in, uh, in item and entity, let's say, uh, categorization, but we seem to be having some trouble with over-tagging. So we've got some precision issues where 3% of our labels were additions that aren't there in the gold set. We have maybe uh, some issues as well with just taxonomy errors. So the entities are being captured, but they're being given the wrong label. We seem to have a much smaller problem with missing entities altogether as only 2% of labels were skipped and so on. So with this approach, we can further break this down by specific labels and develop retraining materials and assessment materials that will further drive improvement and also allow us to build trust by tracking that improvement over time with respect to known problem areas. So in summary, um, what we've shown today is that building trust in data, uh, labeled data set quality rests on three primary cornerstones, transparency of communication in setting our initial assumptions, requirements, and expectations, designing well thought out, carefully considered processes to identify and remove defects, uh, enable constant improvement and measure outputs, and also developing the right kinds of measurement strategies or metrics to interpret our results, understand what's being done well, where improvement is needed, and establish um, trust in the ongoing data pipeline. So thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar on strategies for evaluating the, labeled, uh, the quality of labeled NLP data sets. My name is Teresa O'Neill, and we invite you to reach out and contact me uh, with any comments or questions. Thanks very much for your time and hope you're all staying very safe and well at home.